Hello everyone, and welcome back to another Engineering Statics lecture video. I hope you guys are all doing well and are ready to learn, so let's get started. We're going to get into the fun part now, which is discrete formulas. Remember when we talked about center of gravity, we said that we have an integral formula, but we also have a discrete formula. We can do the same thing with centroids. So just like center of gravity, we can derive discrete form expressions. So for the centroid of a volume, we have the following expressions, but we can convert it into a discrete form as follows. So I just replace the integral with the summation. And I can repeat this process for an area, and I can repeat this process for a line. Again, the only difference is you're replacing the integral with a summation. Now the key here is this. If I know the area and the centroids of all the shapes in an assembly, well then I can use these discrete formulas. And you're saying, well, Clayton, what do you mean an assembly? What exactly does this mean? Well, more often than not in exams, we will have something called composite bodies, where we have a complex looking body, but it's actually just a combination of smaller shapes. And these shapes are actually simple shapes. So again, that would be a composite body. And since we know the centroids of all these simple shapes, we can use discrete formulas. So the best example would be the one that we covered in the last video which is what we call a T-beam. So we have two rectangles kind of welded together or something like that to create kind of a T-looking structure. Now, we don't know the centroid of a T. We don't. But we do know the centroid of a rectangle. And if we were to look here, all we essentially have is two rectangles. So one common exam type question is they'll give you a shape like this that's, again, composed of easy, simple shapes, and they'll give you a bunch of dimensions. And then they'll ask you for something like, what is y bar? Well, if that's the case, and you know that your assembly here is just a bunch of simple shapes, that's your hint to go to the discrete formula, which is the summation of ai times y squiggle i divided by the summation of ai. a is just going to be the area of the shapes, and y squiggle is going to be the distance from the axis to the centroid of those shapes. Again, we know the centroid of a rectangle. That's nice and easy for us. So if we were to look here, we say, okay, I have two shapes, so my summation is going to involve two terms. So I got area of the purple shape times y squiggle the purple shape, plus the area of the blue shape times y squiggle the blue shape, divided by that total area. And then it just becomes plug and chug, because if we were to look, well, the area of a rectangle for the purple one, well, that's just going to be 30 times 150. If you guys are struggling with the area of a rectangle, I think we have bigger issues than what a centroid is. So this is why it becomes nice and easy. The area of the blue shape, well, that's just going to be 100 times 50. And then the last thing that we need is the y squiggle for both of these shapes. But again, that's just the distance from the axis to the centroid. And we know that the centroid of a rectangle is halfway up. So if I was looking for y squiggle of the purple shape, we know it's going to be something like this. So it's going to be 100 plus half of 30. So if we were to type that in, we get 115. If I were to look for y squiggle of the blue shape, again, it's just halfway up our rectangle. It's going to be just 100 divided by 2, which is 50. And if I were to substitute everything into my equation, I get that the centroid is 80.8. And you guys are saying, wow, I didn't realize we were back in kindergarten. This is nice and easy. We're just plugging stuff in. Now, it gets even better, even better. One of the tricks that professors will try and do to sway you from the correct course is they'll give you a composite shape with a hole in it with a hole every time students see a hole they think that they have to go back to integration because it's something complex but when we have an assembly that has holes we actually do the same process but all we have to do to modify it is the area of a hole is negative that's it because we're actually taking away area from our shape you guys are saying well, what what just happened well, let's go into an example, but let's go into a very specific example. Let's look at the exact same situation that we had before, but instead of treating it as two rectangles, let's treat it as one giant rectangle with two holes on the side. So again, we did it like this before, but let's say that instead of that, we have one giant rectangle with two holes. So see at the end, we still get the same shape. If we were to do this again, it's the same process. All we're going to do is find the areas of our shape. So we know for our purple shape, if it's that big giant rectangle, it's going to be 130 times 150. 
we know that the area of our holes is going to be 100 times 50. But again, since it's a hole and we're subtracting area, we have a negative sign. Again, hole is negative area. If I were to look for y squiggle of the purple shape, it's just going to be half the distance of that giant rectangle, which is 130 divided by 2. And then y of uh, not the purple shape, this would be the hole, of course. y squiggle would be 100 divided by 2, which is 50. All I have to do then is just substitute everything back into my discrete equation. And since I have kind of three bodies now, I have the complete rectangle, I have hole 1, and I have hole 2, it's going to have three terms. As we can see, since hole 1 and 2 are the same, we could technically combine it into one term. But I know that there's going to be some troll in the comments saying, Clayton, the, the official way to do this is, and I, <laughs> I don't want to deal with the trolls today, so I just kept it as a nice long form. And again, when we input these into our equation, whenever we have holes, we always have a negative sign on the area. And if you were to substitute this in, you get 80.8, .8, which is exactly the same as before. Isn't this nice? It's, it's actually beautiful. So again, what they'll try to do to throw you off the trail in exams is give you a hole, but you're going to laugh at them, say, I know exactly what to do. I treat it the exact same as before. The only difference is it has negative area. Now, the last thing I'm going to cover is just some centroid tips. There's a lot of ways in exams to make your life easier. And the two most common that students fall for are these. First one is symmetry. And the second one is identifying simple shapes. For symmetric shapes, the centroid will always be located along the line of symmetry. You're saying, what? Clayton, can you please explain that? Well, let's take a rectangle. We've already discussed many times that the centroid of a rectangle is right in the center. And the reason why is because a rectangle has two lines of symmetry. Now, a line of symmetry is an axis, or basically a line, that divides the body into two pieces that are mere images of each other. If I were to look at my rectangle and I were to draw a vertical line, we can see that the piece on the left and the piece on the right are the exact same. They're mere images. So we know that our centroid has to be somewhere along that vertical axis. If I were to do the same thing for a horizontal line, we get the same result. So in this case, we know where our centroid is. It's right at the center. I can repeat the same process for a circle. Again, we know that the circle, it's right at the center. And if I were to draw a vertical line, again, we have two mirror images. And if I were to draw a vert or, sorry, a horizontal line, again, we have those two mirror images. Now, sometimes you won't always have a doubly symmetric shape where we have both X and Y as symmetric, but you might have something that is symmetric along one axis. So if we were to look at a triangle here, we know that there is a mirror image if I were to draw a vertical line. So we know that our centroid, our X bar, is going to be somewhere along that vertical line. Y bar, we would actually have to do some math because we don't know where exactly vertically it, it would be. But for X bar, we know it's just going to be kind of to the midpoint of that shape. So hopefully that helps. The second one, and this is mean. So I'm warning you guys, don't fall for this, okay? This is classic troll professor number one. For simple shapes, we know where the centroid is. We don't need calculus. If I were to give you a square, you know where the centroid is. If I were to give you a rectangle, same thing. Number one question I always see on these centroid exams is the professor will give you something like this, and then they give you the equation. Whenever students see the equation, they go, oh, I need calculus. I need calculus. So they give us the equation. They gave us two axes. It's begging for calculus. But if we were to look at the shape, it's just a triangle with base six and height three. <laughs> We know the centroid of a triangle. So all we have to do in this case is say, oh, well, we know the centroid is going to be B over three in both directions. So it's one of those funny things that I've seen so many students fall for, but just try to identify those simple shapes because if you know what the centroid is, you're good to go. You don't actually need to do any calculus or anything like that. So yeah, that's it for centroids, the second last topic of this lecture video series. Again, next couple of videos are going to be dealing with moment of inertia. And then that's it. So you guys are almost there. I'm so proud of each and every one of you. And yeah, that's it for this video. So thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I will see you all in the next lecture video.